So I'm here to talk to you about criminality and the consequences I'm in particular of talking about untreated ADHD. And I think that's because, as I mentioned, untreated ADHD, because so many of the offenders and prisoners that come onto our radar actually don't have their ADHD recognised or treated. And, you know, we, we kind of see the outcome of what happens for people with untreated ADHD. And when I'm looking for a picture that might summarise what I think, it does feel like our young people, some of them are kind of lining up like this to sort of jump off a cliff with such bleak outcomes. Uh, why is it that young people get involved, that like, like interface with the criminal justice system? Well, I think they're, because they're vulnerable. And there's three reasons in the criminal justice system that they're vulnerable. First thing is they're not very good offenders. They get caught. I think, you know, because they're engaging perhaps in opportunistic crime. They're not going to be the masterminders of a grand sort of uh, larceny that's all well planned out and thought out and, all, and, and part of organised crime. And there's high rates of uh, recidivism because they're consistently, that it's opportunistic or emotionally driven, getting into fights in the pubs and things like that. Then when they're in the system, they have to cope with the whole process of the criminal justice system, which can be, as many of you know, quite complex. I mean, they have to go through a police interview, they have to attend court, and then for some they have to, uh, they get community services and they have to cope with the stigma and label of that, and also then with, um, uh, for others going into prison. And I'm going to go through uh, each of those um, interfaces uh, in turn. And then, if they are incarcerated, those in particular who are undiagnosed and untreated, they're really struggling in the prison systems. And I've got data that will show you things that we data that we've got actually from Scotland, and we've also got a study going on uh, in the east of London at the moment. And because they're struggling, they're a management problem due to their behavioural problems, because I think their difficulties are misunderstood. It's important to be mindful of how complex the offender pathway is. And this was a sort of a, a figure that was put together by a group of us actually at a consensus statement with everyone trying to put work, working out what this pathway is. And they all start, of course, with defence and an arrest. And then they go through, they might be charged to attend court, they might not be. So they oscillate between some of these stages at various times in their life. And then they have to attend court, and then that might be adjourned for lots of reasons. They have to decide what they're going to plead, and uh, you know, then if they plead guilty, they move to sentence. If they're not, they move to trial. And then well, after the trial, then there's post-court sentencing, and depending on where they are, I'm sorry, that's sort of one of the, it's some of the uh, pictures have moved a bit from going from think of Mac onto this system. But when they get onto post courts, uh, you know, depending on where they are, whether it's their first offence, second offence, third, fourth, fifth, whatever, depends on on what 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 the sentencing is, and it sort of um, increases. It gets worse as they go along if they continue in in a criminal trajectory. A while ago, uh, my colleagues, some colleagues, Gizzy Johnson and I, and other colleagues, we wanted to know um, how many people it, presenting in, at police custody have got ADHD, and what's going on? What difficulties are presenting for young people with ADHD in police custody? We went into a very large uh, uh, police station in, the, in South East London, and one where most of the youths actually are sent. It. They work particularly with youth, with youths, but also with adults. And we, there were about, we screened about 195 young people and adults at this uh, in police custody. And here we found that nearly 77% screened positive for learning disability. That now is intellectual disability. <laughs> it's, a, but what, uh, but it's the old-fashioned term. I must change my slide. Um, but intellectual disability. Um, three quarters of them screened positive for having a history of conduct disorder. 
so having a history of difficulties and difficult problems, um, anti-establishment attitudes and what have you. So around 20%, roughly, uh, were had ADHD. We, the, this is reporting that one was a screen, one was uh, then we, they went on to another screen, and then, but all told, if you adjust it, it was 18.5%, but actually if you unadjusted, it was just under a quarter. So if we take about 20%. Now, out of those who screened positive for ADHD, and we didn't just do the screens, we also did full clinical diagnostic interviews on these people. We screened, and then we did a full clinical diagnostic interview using the DIVA. So you can imagine that was a very large large amount of work to do in police custody. And we had to adjust to say why we had to make this adjustment at interview was because many of these young people, the screens take, the sorry, the interviews take a long time. So we'd screen and positive and then we'd ask to do the interview. And then they'd be released and they weren't going to hang around and say, well, I'm just going to stay in police custody while I help these people with this interview. <laughs> they were off and out of there. So we lost quite a few people at that stage. So we had to make an adjustment for, you know, for not knowing what the outcome might have been at interview. So that's why we dropped from a quarter to the 18% that you see here. But of those who did screen positive for ADHD, Nearly all of them, 96%, also screened positive for having comorbid co history of conduct disorder or intellectual disability. So they're a real vulnerable group. They, they, and we know that, you know probably, that the, um, the rule uh, is that young people will have something else. It's ADHD plus some comorbid um, coexisting disorder. That's the rule rather than the exception. And certainly here in this group, 96% had some kind of intellectual or conduct problem in their history. Compare these rates, though, to the red rates, which are the, actually should be the other way around. The, I, I often think that the red rates should be the ADHD rates, you know, because, uh, the, uh, and the, uh, the disability rates, because they're so startlingly larger than the community rates, which are the ones I'm showing in red. <laughs> So 7% compared to up to 2% in the, with, in the normal population. 75% of conduct disorder compared to up to 2% in the community. ADHD being, you know, around about 23, 20 to 23% um, compared to 3 to 4% of the child population or with the adults, 2.5% of the adult population much higher, much more significant concentration, proportion of young people with ADHD in these settings, plus the high rates of comorbidity. We happened to be there during the London riots. Do you remember the London riots with all the fires and all the stuff that was going on? And there we, you know, we, we, we were continuing to assess young people there. And what we noticed in the two weeks following the London riots, the people that were processed there the rates increased for ADHD. It wasn't a significant increase, but they did increase. And it's hard to say this is due to people who with ADHD who might be attracted to rioting behaviour because, you know, we, we don't know from the board that they're there for a riot. We know that they're there for theft or whatever that, you know, that they, they were involved in. But just to say it was interesting that at a point of the riots when, you know, I, I have a there, and then I had a teenage daughter myself, and she was watching this on television, and she was telling me where it was going to be next. I said, how do you know? And it was because it was, that was the day of the Blackberry. We remember the Blackberries. Um, because they, it was all coming through the Blackberries with the young people, with the groups. And they were saying where, where the next concentration of young people was going to be. And you can imagine, you can see how that might be attractive to young people who were disenchanted with education, with opportunity, with disenchanted with the opportunities that they have, and get involved and go rushing off. And then how young people with ADHD, who are impulsive, who are, have problems with emotional control, would get carried away and start to get involved in a whole group effect and get themselves into trouble. When they were in custody, we were interested in uh, how they were behaving in custody. What, what difficulties? Did they present with any difficulties? Um, well, so we recorded the number of requests 
of food and drink and telephone calls while they were in custody. And basically, this is when they were in their cells. And really, it was the effect of how often they were bashing the bell with, with some kind of request or demand. So how often they were doing this when they were in the cell. And these young people might spend quite a lot of time in a cell you know, before they're interviewed. Well, in terms of the number of demands, maybe we obviously had to control for the length of time that they spent in detention. And there was a significant correlation with history of conduct disorder, history of ADHD, and with current presentation of ADHD symptoms. For each diagnosis, those who were screening positive made significantly more demands. So with conduct disorder or ADHD, they were making many more demands, pressing that bill many more times in the cells compared to uh, people without these, uh, the people who were not, didn't, didn't rate, were not rated as having these conditions. And then we went on and did further analysis to look at what was the most powerful predictor of the pressing the bells. And actually it was ADHD. It was ADHD was driving it much more than others. And the second driver was alcohol, a history of alcohol use that they reported. And this was over and above comorbid conduct disorder. Now, we would expect it to be conduct disorder, wouldn't we, because of its association with antisocial behaviour. But no, the demanding, the difficulty in the cells, the demanding behaviours that pushing that bell were associated with use of, with alcohol, sorry, with ADHD, and secondly, with use of alcohol. Then, they go in and they're interviewed by the police. And... We did a study, uh, I did it with, uh, quite a while ago with Jessica Bramham, Jessica Johnson, a group of us, um, in our patients at the Maudsley. And we tested people with ADHD. We wanted to know how susceptible are they to interrogative suggestibility, to being pressured by the police. Will they yield to police pressure and will they shift their answers when they're interrogated? Because this actually is one of the re a possible reason for false confessions in young people with ADHD. And Gizdika Johnson has done a lot of work on false confessions, both in, Isla uh, in, in Iceland um, and elsewhere. And he's, he's found and reported that there is a huge association between, uh, between offenders with ADHD and uh, making false confessions. Usually because they're covering, perhaps covering up for somebody else, or they're making a confession, maybe just because they're motivated to get out of that police station. Um, so we wanted to know what role might interrogative suggestibility play. And we know already that youths are much more suggestible than adults. So what we do, I better explain, what we do with this test is that you read someone a story, and then you ask them questions. You, 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 they, you, you ask them to tell, to tell you what they remember about the story. And you do that immediately and then after a delay. And then you go through and you ask them questions about the story. And some of which are new questions, new things that you're putting in, in there. Things that weren't in the story. Okay? So, you know, was, 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 was Judge John O'Connor uh, uh, the person who, who dealt with them when they went, when, when they went to court? What's not even in the story, right? So, um, and we see how that whether they say yes or no, or I can't remember. You look, and then you tell them, well, you've not done very well, and you go through it again. And then when you go through it again, you see whether they shift their answer, whether they yield again, whether they shift from saying no, he wasn't present to yes, he was. So that's inter that's a response to interrogative suggestibility. Um, what we found is that they had significantly impaired, immediately and delayed verbal memory. So we expect that. People with ADHD don't remember things very well because of their difficulties with attention. But we also found that they were no different to anybody else uh, uh, in terms of their suggestibility, in terms of their suggestibility scores. But, you know, this study really made us very pleased that, because often when you do things, you get research, you get researchers to score things. But Gisley and I actually went through all of these and scored them ourselves. And had we not done this, we might not have picked up something that was really important. And it's because that even for what we call the recognition items, the items that you ask a question and it was there, 
you know, so did, did, did it, did, was the meeting at the Law Society at Blackpool Place? Yes, it's a recognition item. So you expect people to know that because they would recognise it. it. You know, it's not something they've got to actually, well, sort of think about and remember, you know, think, think in their memory about. They would recognise it because it's true. And what they said is they answered they didn't know to all of, to, to most of the, or if not all, of the recognition items. It, and what you saw was don't know, don't know, don't know, oh, I can't remember, can't remember, don't know, just, and they just gave up. It was just don't know, everything was don't know. So what does that mean? So if they're being interviewed by the police, and the police are asking them a question that they know they know, like, what do you mean you don't know the road? It's, your school was in that road. You went to school in that road. Your grandmother lives in the same road. And they're saying, I don't know, I don't know. They will be perceived to be evasive, to not being helpful, perhaps to knowing something that they don't want to disclose. The police will treat them differently. They'll become suspicious about this. And what it is, is I think they just don't trust their memory. They, this is a strategy of don't know, don't know, don't know. And of course, when you're interviewed, if you're a youth in the UK, you have to have an appropriate adult present with you. Because of the heritability rates of ADHD being so high, that the chances are of that being a parent with ADHD and undiagnosed ADHD as well is very high. And that parent might be sitting there saying, oh, look, just tell the officer what he wants to know. Come on, let's just, because they are motivated to get out of that situation as well, because they're struggling in that situation. So we recommended that, that, that there need to be specific questions at the point in, in, when they're processed in police custody to ask, do you have uh, a, 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 actually a, a diagnosed uh, a disability of any kind, neurodevelopmental, such as ADHD or autism? That we, they need to know that and ask specifically. The problem is that that still won't pick up people who are undiagnosed. Then they have to go to court where they have to pay attention, they have to listen, they have to understand the evidence, they have to follow it. And these, you know, sometimes it can be quite complex in there. It's a joint enterprise issue, there's, there's a lot, lot of counsel there, a lot of people popping up and down asking questions, there's a whole public gallery, people watching them, staring at them. Um, it's quite an intimidating place. Even experts get, you know, experts get nervous. I get nervous when I'm, in, when I'm presenting in court and you're standing in there and people are, like firing questions at you. So, and a defendant who is as young, perhaps who's not hasn't got much, let, let, hasn't got the experience um, hasn't, uh, of of the court, even with preparation, that's going to impact even more on their ability to pay attention. Anxiety will come in and make their symptoms worse in that situation. So it's important to determine whether someone has got ADHD or whether it's appropriate to give them medication for their ADHD if they haven't and perhaps to, to have that to make sure that I think we, I think we need to reach out to raise awareness in legal teams, in legal in, law, in lawyers and solicitors so that they, they are more cued in on it. I get a lot of letters from parents who tell me my, my son or my daughter, usually son, is, uh, is in trouble and he's got, a, and he's got ADHD and, he had, and the lawyers aren't interested. And I don't know why the lawyers aren't interested. I can't get involved at that stage. But they feel that they're not being heard, and it's not. And I, I don't. I wonder sometimes how much that's because they don't. They, they, it's not on their radar. Um, of course, in court, special provisions need to be made for individuals who are unmedicated or who have active symptoms, and that means you know we need to explain to um, in, to the jury perhaps that this person has got ADHD and what this means. Um, uh, that, that, and we need to explain, make sure that counsel are only putting one question at a time rather than multiple questions, for example. That they have regular breaks during trial. I mean, even I, you know, when I'm presenting, sometimes I get someone in the audience and they, they, they stand up and say, well, I want to ask you this and then this and then this. And I, by the time they've asked me the last, I can't remember the first. You know, and it, and we all know what that's like. You know, so special provisions need need to be done, made. Um, then they go to prison. Well, a few years back, there were so many different rates of how many people 
there are with ADHD in the prison. We really didn't know. Some You could look at it and think, well, everyone in prison has got ADHD, which, of course, was ridiculous. But, but some of some the rates were so variable. So what I did was I put together, I did a measure analysis across of international data of the, reporting the prison rates. And we took, we put, did a meta analysis on those using screening rates, and they were a bit higher, and those using um, rate, provide, uh, estimating rates using clinical diagnostic interviews, proper interviews. And with that, we found that in adult prisons, 26% using this methodology uh, uh, of prisoners had a, a uh, had ADHD. And with the youth prisons, it was about it was a bit higher. It was thirty percent, but there was no significant difference between the two. I think there was a difficulty with the youth dividing out youth and adults that way, because different countries have different ages for youth offending, and so what, you know the ages for uh, youth uh, uh, youth institutions where there might be so that there might be some muddying of the waters in between those two. But there were no differences internationally with this basic rate of around about a quarter. <coughs> That's a lot of people in prison with ADHD, most of which is undiagnosed. In fact, of all the research that I've done in prisons, it's usually us, um, the researchers, who are going in, who are recognising that through our assessments that, this, that these people have got ADHD. We also meta-analyze uh, the psychiatric morbidity in the prisoners with and without ADHD. Well, I wanted to know, well, what does this mean in terms of comorbidity? The first group here on the left are, are the youths under 18s. The ones on the right are the adults, uh, the over 18s. The paler blue is if you don't have ADHD. The darker blue is if you do. And if you look at the youths, the one significant difference there was mood. The youths were significantly more likely to have a mood disorder uh, compared to offenders without ADHD. And that is really important to know because when young people go into prison, the risk of uh, suicidal ideation and attempting suicide is its highest at its first couple of weeks when someone goes into prison. So if somebody has a mood, uh, develop, if there's concern about the mood, and, and that's recognised, but they also recognise this person has ADHD, which means they might act out on the impulse to do something or seize the opportunity if they see it to do something without thinking through the consequences, then the, 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 establishment need, the institution needs to know that. They need to recognise that. By the time we get to the adults, in the adult prisons, they've got significantly more of everything. If you've got ADHD, you're significantly more, much more likely to have a history of conduct disorder, to have a history of anxiety, mood, substance use disorder, and personality disorder. So, it, 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 I know these are, these are taken at one point at time, child and adult, but I think that what happens and what we see is that as young people grow up, Things accumulate and they get worse. I often think of it as, you know, you start off with an empty bag or rucksack. And as young people get older with ADHD and as they grow up, more and more gets put into that sack and it gets heavier and heavier. And it's all the baggage and everything that's being carried forward. And they don't know what to do with it. It gets so heavy they can't, they don't know quite what, but they don't know how to deal with it. So they're complex. By the time they're adults, these prisoners are complex. And yet, we, we're we not screening for ADHD at the point when young people go into prison. And one of the problems is that the screens are very long. I did work, there's, there's, one, there's one in the UK called The Chat. I can't remember what it stands for. Child Health Assessment. Something. Sorry? Comprehensive Health Assessment. Thank you. Comprehensive Health Assessment, The Chat. Um, and I was asked with colleagues ages ago, long donkey's years ago, what, what could we put in there about ADHD? And we had a meeting at UCAN and we made a few suggestions. It was just some clinical ideas. The feedback I've had is that it's not, it's, it's not capturing, people would say it's not capturing very well but, um, for ADHD. But the adult prisons don't get that. 
Um, and I'm going to tell you about one that we've since developed. There's only six items that can be done, and it's, um, it's come from empirical evaluation. Given there's 25% of prisoners here with, with, a likely diagno with, with a diagnosis of ADHD that's likely to be unrecognized, I really think that there's, it's unacceptable that the prisons are not screening for ADHD at this point when they go in. And I'm sorry, this is powerful language, but I really do feel... And, and I, I'm, I get very annoyed about it, and I've got to a point where I've had to argue this on a health economic analysis, because if they don't care about health, maybe they'll care about money. Let's talk the language that they do care about, and I'm going to come back to that. So we know that ADHD is associated with higher rates of recidivism. We did, uh, I've done studies, more than one study, this is for what, from one study, that looked at uh, the pink is ADHD, the blue is the non-ADHD offenders. This is from one Scottish prison in Aberdeen. And you can see significantly higher number of total convictions, in, that's the recidivism, in, uh, um, especially property and violence, and violent offending. And violent offending, of course, is where they're getting uh, uh, emotional and uh, getting into trouble, fights and what have you. We looked at that in Aberdeen Prison, and we looked at we looked at the wing records of critical incidents, and these are ratings that were made on the wing by prison staff. And when we did this analysis, we controlled for uh, this is in an adult uh, it was an adult prison. We controlled for um, antisocial personality disorder, and what we found is the. Uh, this very tall one along here, this is the total critical incident. If you've got ADHD, you're involved in far more critical incidents in the prison. Serious, these are serious incidents of verbal aggression, physical aggression, damage to property. Um, so a total altogether, far more incidents. Especially, if you look on the left-hand side, verbally aggressive incidents. And on the far right hand side, severity of aggression. So it was, um, so they might um, get involved at the same rate of getting involved in physical aggression, but the severity of that if you've got ADHD will be much more pronounced, much more marked. And I think that's because I often think of ADHD as being a disorder of extremes. They can't, there's no break to their behavior. If they're going to shout and scream, they're going to yell and actually really go for it. There's not a little slap or punch or tickle. It's like an absolute full-on fight. It's an extreme, and it's the same with their emotions. And that actually is exhausting for them to be constantly at an extreme and exhausting for the people around them, whether it's at home with parents or in this institution. And you can imagine what happens. They get bad reputation, they get additional adjudications, they're getting into trouble. They're not the model prisoners who are perhaps going to get out early. And in fact, you know, there was so much recidivism at one of the prisons where we did one of our uh, studies that um, we, we, it, it, this was in uh, Inverness Prison. There was uh, when we, we were asking about we had well we had a, an awful lot that we wanted to do to tease out about these about the prisoners there. And we had to we saw them on three separate occasions, and we'd lose some of them because they'd go. And some of the prison officers would say to us, "Oh, don't worry, he'll be back." We were there for over two years, and true enough, six months later, that person was back. And the, the researchers were telling me um, that that was what was happening. We looked at what predicts offending. What is predicting offending in young people with ADHD? And we looked at various predictors, like how old they were at their first conviction. Their, how, how severe their ADHD currently was, the, 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 the level of symptoms that they had, history of uh, whether they had antisocial personality disorder, use of substances, um, and, and uh, what we found is that the highest predictor of offences more generally was drug use, followed by history of child ADHD. But drug use was was obviously very prevalent, around 70% of all prisoners, whether you've got ADHD or not, are using, uh, have got a history of substance use disorder. But you can see by looking down here, um, you've got um, alcohol dependence for violent offenders, crack cocaine for drug offences, heroin. Um, so a lot of drug use is predicting offending. 
in this prison in Scotland. What took us slightly back was that for violent offenders, the most powerful predictor of violent offenders was a history of childhood ADHD. We also looked for current symptoms of ADHD and we had a similar pattern. So drugs are very important, but the most powerful predictor of violent offending was ADHD. There's a lot of concern in prisons about uh, treating people with, uh, with stimulant medication, for example. In, in, you know, I, I, some of us don't, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, some of us don't quite understand this because it, it, they give meth, uh, methadone programs in, in prison for substance use, um, for substance abusers, so I don't see why they can't sort of make arrangements to, uh, to give controlled medication as well. But we thought, well, maybe if we can demonstrate that the pathway into misusing substances for offenders is different if you've got ADHD, maybe they'll look at it differently. Perhaps it's their, their, because the theory is that they might be self-medicating, using substances to self-medicate. So to do this, we actually had to develop a questionnaire. If anyone does any research, you can download this questionnaire. Um, uh, it's available on my website uh, in the resources section. It's called The Stars. And this is when we looked at what was the motivation for initiation, for using a first drug. Why did you maintain its use? Why did you transition to using another substance? And why did you maintain those other substances? So it's the pathway in. That's what we were interested in. And when we looked at, generally, in the prison, all the substance users, we put them together, what you can see on the left is the pathway in was nothing particularly predicted for the first initiation, but then it was very much dependency and sensation-seeking. It was all about thrills and sensation-seeking, and then, obviously, you use something quite a lot, you start to develop a dependency, and you may begin to accept drugs as a way of life at the end. So that was the pathway for them. We looked at the pathway for those with a history of conduct disorder. And here, it wasn't entirely dissimilar. It was sensation-seeking, prompting it to begin with, and then sort of moving into acceptance and dependency. But some, at the end of the, by the time they're using and maintaining other substances, um, it's also they're having to use it to cope with difficulties that they have as part of their dependency. The ADHD group were markedly different. They were so different to the other two groups. Because here it was coping, 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 coping. They started to cope with their problems and difficulties. That's what enticed them to try something in the first place. They maintained because they found it helpful. This is cannabis, take cannabis, keep to be calm, keep them perhaps feeling calmer. Um, they move on to something else. Again, to cope and dependencies coming in here. And then they maintain that because for those, for those same reasons, to continue to cope. This, we wanted to call this self-medication, not coping. But the reviewers of the paper said, no, well, you don't actually know that, which is true. Fair enough. So we had to call it coping. But I think we all recognize that this is a self-medication kind of pattern. So that's the reason they're doing it. So they're in prison, 25%. They've been using drugs and they've got a dependency on drugs to cope with life's difficulties. And then in prison, they might not be able to access these drugs. They're kicking up. They're, they're involved in lots of critical incidents. And the whole problem is escalating and spiraling. What happens then when they get out of prison? So we went and asked the probation services in the UK. Now, first I have to tell you, we have such a poor response rate, despite huge support from uh, the relevant departments to help get this involved, to, to, asking people to do this, sending out emails for us. And um, we went into several, across several trusts in the UK. Still, they weren't really responding. And in the end, we just couldn't keep keep on at them. We were almost like stalking them. Um, so, but and the issue I think is that they're just very overworked and you know really struggling with this. But Few of them reported to have received any training in ADHD, to know anything about ADHD, really. They estimated that 8% of their caseload had ADHD. Then we went into one of the trusts and actually uh, assessed this and screened for it, and we found that actually 20% probably did. They perceived that that 8% of their caseload had specific 
difficulties in terms of their lifestyle compliance and their cognitive abilities, and that this, these problems hindered meaningful engagement with their service and with the rehabilitation that they had to offer. They were difficult for them to reach. They struggled. They, there was something about this group that they recognised that was qualitatively different in terms of how they could meaningfully work with them and what they might achieve. They saw them as difficult to manage because of what we called internal processes, the, the motivation and engagement of people with ADHD, because they don't turn up, or when they do, they can't, they can't sit, can't, they, they're all over the place, they can't sit and concentrate. But also, they found them difficult to manage due to what we call old external processes, because they did acknowledge that they themselves, they felt they didn't have uh, appropriate interventions. They didn't feel that they had the skills or knowledge as to how to work in a particular way with people who present in this way. <coughs> so, to this point, I've been talking and talking about to lots of people about all these problems, presenting it, and nothing's changing. What I do know is it's what, what has changed is that years ago I used to be speaking about this at the graveyard, the graveyard shift, Friday afternoon at half past four at the end of a conference when most people have gone home. Uh, now we have whole days about this topic and I'm the first. <laughs> um, but me being the personality I have, I, 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 got, I was getting increasingly frustrated because we're, I'm putting out the data, we're doing the data, my colleagues are doing the data, we're putting it all out there, and it's like nobody's listening. And also I'm getting lots of emails from, from people that, you know, like, research is statistics. When you talk about, listen to people and their lives and the difficulties, why, why should a young person have not have a, 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 a lawyer who just disregards the fact that they have ADHD. I mean, I don't, I don't know the circumstances, so maybe it wasn't relevant, but at least find out, <laughs> you know, why should that be happening? So I thought, well, what do they care about? Well, they care about money, or politicians. So let's look at the economics, see if I can argue on money, the economic consequences of ADHD in the prison. So we went into, uh, where was it? It was Inverness Prison where we assessed 390 adult males, mean age of 30. And here what we did is we screened them all, and we gave all of them, whether they screened positive or negative, we gave all of them uh, a, a, a clinical uh, interview to assess for ADHD called the DIVA-2. Well, 32% of, uh, um, uh, sorry, 25% uh, of them, same as the meta-analysis roughly, had ADHD using that methodology. So that was married up nicely. But 80% of them had not received a diagnosis before. Only 20% had ever had a diagnosis. So, and actually, I, that was better than I expected. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of them, most of them are unrecognized, undiagnosed, and therefore untreated, and their needs are not met. Of those people with ADHD, around a third of them had literacy problems. And 55% had had a traumatic brain uh, uh, had received had a traumatic brain injury in the past. Um, compared back to the prisoners without ADHD, where the rates were 70% for literacy problems and 40% uh, for TBI. What we did then is we did the health utilities index on them, and this measures health-related quality of life over the past four weeks. So we did this assessment on them, and that from that you can um, calculate quality qualities, which are quality adjusted life years. And qualities are what the NICE guidelines use to assess whether a treatment is of value or not, and whether they might recommend it. So it's an important, really important measure because it, it it tells you whether you can make a difference in terms of life years to someone's life if you give this treatment, and they do all their um, measure analysis and, they, and th this is what they use to assess and make their recommendations. So we did this for the past four months, so we were able to extrapolate from that and calculate it for a year. Right, so we just multiplied it for the year. Of course there may be differences, it's 
fluctuations over that period. But that, that's how we did it because it made sense to do that. With a quali, the score ranges from zero to one. Zero, you're dead. One is you're in absolute perfect health. Nothing completely perfect. To give you an idea, general, if you go in the general population, the norms are 0.91 to 0.93. But a clinically relevant difference, something that you know you would notice or note, you need to know, is a difference of 0.03. So on the quality, it's just small, a small amount of 0.03 is enough that would make someone sit up and think, oh, perhaps this person needs some kind of intervention or treatment, right? Because it's a clinically relevant difference. If we look at qualities for inmates without ADHD or without a traumatic brain injury, the average, it was poorer than the uh, general population norms. It was 0.72. It's quite a lot poorer, okay? When you bear in mind that a clinically relevant difference is 0.03. And if you look at those with uh, uh, only a TBI, well, and it was similar to TBI. It, what we did, though, is we adjusted then for age, for anxiety, for depression, other things that might affect the quality rating. So we took those things out, we controlled for those, and we found that if you've got, for inmates with ADHD, the quality was, was significantly lower. It was 0 0.20 lower. Now we're getting really quite low in terms of uh, um, quality adjusted life years. And if they had ADHD and a traumatic brain injury, which many of them did, it was 0 0.30 lower. We looked at the medical and prison service use, and we looked at the medical records in the prison for the past three months, which consisted of visits to healthcare, cost, uh, uh, but but it didn't. It didn't include cost of treatment or hospital stays. Of course, that would be an additional cost. And this was calculated from local trust NHS reference costs. We looked at the prison records and calculated reference costs there from the UK Ministry of Justice and HMPS uh, reference costs. And we, there we were recording things like behaviour-related incidents, like the critical incidents, uh, number of adjudications, because that costs money to to have an adjudication. Non-attendance to activities, not turning up for things, there's a cost associated with that. So we looked at those kind of things. And what we found is when we put the two together, both the medical and the prison costs, they were significantly higher for people if they had ADHD than offenders if they didn't have ADHD. But actually, in this prison, this was very much driven by the medical costs because they were costing a lot of money going to GP and nursing staff for both physical and mental health needs. So remember, most of these people, 80% of them did not have a diagnosis, of the ADHD group, 80% didn't have a diagnosis of ADHD. But they are consistently presenting themselves to the medical centre for all sorts of other difficulties and problems. And somehow, in that setting as well, there's an opportunity to identify ADHD and it's being missed. I don't want to be critical because it has to be on the radar to pick it up. There needs to be, there's a clear need for training here. Um, prison costs were similar, so the greater demand was on the NHS. I would say, though, that um, in other studies, so like in the Inverness study, we had huge amount of critical incidents associated with ADHD. In this prison, there weren't for some reason. Maybe it's just because of how the, their processes were different. So the prison costs, though, would be much higher in a prison where where they have operations that are different, where you are having a lot a lot more costs in terms of management to the prison service. From that, though, from those figures, we can see well we, we were able to estimate that per adult inmate with ADHD that they cost five hundred and ninety pounds per annum more than those inmates without ADHD. And if you add that up and extrapolate, extrapolate that for the number of prisoners, estimated 25% of the prison population, and 77,500 adult male inmates in the UK, that's 11.7 million per year. That's, 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 that's worth 
having, isn't it, to the prison population, you know? And bearing in mind that this is a conservative estimate, and it's conservative because it excludes care costs, because of the ex significantly higher number of crit critical incidents in other prisons that are associated with ADHD. And also it doesn't include what might be saved in terms of people being treated and it changing their offending patterns. Because there's been a study that found that there was a one-third reduction in the crime rate when receiving ADHD medication. So when I see a, a, a commissioner now, I will say, right, okay, so you're not interested in ADHD, what are you interested in? And I'll say, whatever. And I'll say, okay, well, if I can find you 12 million a year, that will help you with that. Would you say no? no? Of course not. I said, well, this is how you can do it. So it's about, maybe we have to set it differently to them. But this study, such an important study, was done in Sweden using the Swedish National Registers of over 25,000 patients with ADHD. And they have registers on, you know, on everyone, on the medication, on the prison records. They, 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 they follow everyone. These registers are very useful for research. And they looked at this, the uh, medication and criminal convictions over a period of three years. And they found that 37% of males and 15% of females had been convicted of at least one crime. But when they were on medication, they were able to do this fancy analysis that took the individual uh, and when they were, when they were uh, uh, um, and, and their crimes and looking at, when, and the, at the individual when they were on or off medication at the individual's. And they found that there was a 32% reduction in crime rate for men and a 41% for women. And it was the same no matter what medication, that they, but it had to be an ADHD medication. Think good researchers, they looked to see whether there was a difference with uh, you know, other types of medication like antidepressants, and they found actually that that finding didn't hold. So it's a peculiar, it's a particular finding for ADHD, treating ADHD and ADHD medications. This is how we had the potential to reduce the crime rate. In fact, there is a remarkable effect that's been reported of methylphenidate of, uh, right, the, the, um, in uh, stimulant medication in prisoners with ADHD. This was uh, a study uh, that was done in, again in Sweden uh, that was a uh, after a uh, the blue lines are the, the people on the placebo. For the first few weeks, they were given the placebo. The red line you see in the first few weeks, for the first five weeks, there was a big effect in reduction in symptoms, whereas the placebo say, stayed the same. And then they went across and they all went onto, um, onto the medication and the placebo group started to come down. So it's, you know, it, it's very clear here about in terms of measuring symptoms, what could be achieved. The Chow product, project is a project that I've been involved in that Philip Asherson is leading in the 12 week open label study of male prisoners with ADHD. This is the, we've been doing a, we're doing a random, we moved on to a randomized control trial, but this is the preliminary data from the first, from the open label that we first started, um, which followed with a six month extension of young people aged 18 to 24. 19% uh, of these young people met DSM-5 criteria for ADHD, and we put 40% of them were treated with um, stimulant meds. And again, you can see here, this is looking at observer-rated ADHD symptoms. Um, the blue line is inattentive symptoms, the red line is hyperactive impulsive symptoms, and you can see that there's a big reduction in symptoms in the first few weeks, five weeks, and then it seems to level off, but still goes down a little bit, and then levels off towards the 12 week mark. In terms of emotional lability, similar pattern here that was significant reduction, um, and it was significantly obviously better to control their emotions, and that this seems to level off. Um, across the uh, 12, it's starting to rise a bit there at the end. So it'll be interesting to see whether that's maintained. 
Maudsley Violence Questionnaire asks about attitudes towards violence, and it measures machismo, how much they're sort of, you know, sizing up, and that more behaviourly behaviorly related. And the uh, attitude is the blue line, but the machismo is the red one. So you can see in terms of attitude, it didn't change attitude, but it did change perhaps the behaviour. Maybe they were thinking through to the response, you know, to what, what the, the outcome or the consequences of their behaviour. But, you know, we need to be changing attitudes as well. And this is just a medication trial. We need to be providing the right psychological treatments with these people as well to give them, um, in the hope of giving them a much better outcome. Critical incidents went down considerably, as you can see here. And actually, the number of positive reports came up during this trial for in, 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 at, at the outcome of the 12 group. We had qualitative reports of improvement. They were less irritable and angry. They talked about feeling calmer. They had time to stop and think. They were less physically and verbally aggressive. They, they were saying they were able to attend educational and rehabilitation sessions because they were able to sit and listen, or they were less distracted and less disruptive. So they were able to take advantage of things that were being offered to them within in, for their rehabilitation by the prison. They talked about they were able to write letters to their family. How important is that? You know, they're able to actually communicate with the family and sit down and do, write a letter. They were less anxious, less depressed, they said their mood was better. Some reported they don't have panic attacks anymore. They reported they have less self-harming behaviours and to sleep better. During the trial, this, during this, this study, um, there was a prison inspector inspector room visit. And this is an outside, unbiased perspective that highlighted the benefits of the CHOW project. In their report, they said, all prisoners were offered screening for ADHD through the specialist concerta and ADHD treatment in adult offenders in the CHOW trial. Some prisoners on the CHOW program to whom we spoke were experiencing some stability of behaviour for the first time in their lives. <coughs> There should be efforts to ensure the continued prescribing of medication and ongoing specialist support for prisoners started, started on the child trial following their relief. What do we do beyond the gates? Prison is an opportunity to do something. We have, there's a captive market there to sort of do something and work with them. But then they've got to get out and there's got to be a bridge between prison to everyday life. Compliance. Well, 60% uh, completed the 12-week trial. And this is something that needs to be addressed. Um, they were dropping out because some didn't like the side effects of medication. The appetite reduction, sleep disturbance, etc. And you've got a list of those in, your, in, your, uh, in, in the copy of my slide. Some left because there was an unexpected transfer. Was, it wasn't expected. Some just didn't, said they didn't like the program. Uh, some it was just reported as they just weren't compliant. They just wouldn't, wouldn't. There was no particular reason. They just didn't want to do it. One, the family didn't like it. Family said they don't like them being on this medication. And some were found to be a small number were found to be concealing medications that they were taking off it. Some of those you can deal with. We're used to side effects, uh, the unexpected transfer that could be could have. Sorted out. No, no, that, 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 that could be addressed. Um, I don't know why they didn't like the program. We need to know a bit more about that. Um, family and concealing media. Some of, the, some of these things could be dealt with. We know, though, that if we look at this middle one through studies, that if you compare pharmacological treatment with non pharmacological treatment and combined treatment in terms of outcomes, we can see that combination treatment the one that's got the circle around it, the dark blue, um, has a much better outcome compared to non-pharmacological treatment and combination treatment. And that's what I've said. I gave you the example with the aggressive, the masochistic, uh, macho um, versus acceptance of violence. That we need, they, they, need, they need medication plus they need something else. We don't want them to become better offenders so they don't get caught anymore. We want them to change their behaviour. An attitude. So, 
I'm going to go, I've got to, I'm going to stop talking now because here everyone's getting <laughs> um, So what I've got here is uh, you've got a case study of John. It's a brief one. It would be nice if you could join little groups and talk about it. Read it and talk about it. And there's a few questions at the end um, that I'd like you to be thinking about, about what you think should be done. And what, what, what are... Yeah, what are John's needs, both specific needs and broad needs? What should be done next? And I want to know what you think, not just, don't just be broad, that's too simple. Who should do what at that stage? What obstacles might prevent that from happening or for his needs not being met? And then Fiona kindly said that she'd come up because I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, and so if there's any discussion about medication, then that will be helpful. Right, so you need to screen and diagnose, you need to provide optimal medical treatment, you need to provide individual group support in prison, they need psychoeducation, support during a titration phase of medical treatment, they need psychological support and treatment because the, the uh, multimodal approach has the, uh, has the largest treatment effect for treating ADHD. Then we need to think about, as we said, move into the communication. How are they going to access medication? Has that been set up? Um, how they're going to, uh, do they need to, and if so, how uh, to ac access uh, expert mental health advice, they need social support, and perhaps critical time interventions that, you know, that where, where people work specifically to, to, to get a smooth transition from prison into the community is helpful, and uh, longer term support with social support, as everyone here was identifying. The problems are that people are very disorganised, they're forgetful, uh, there's emotional instability, poor motivation. Housing it can be uh, just some practical difficulties cause all sorts of problems. Housing, unemployment, poverty, um, then, and who they mix with, peer pressure, moving away from uh, you know from uh, people that perhaps are groups that have got them into problems to form relations, social relationships. I mentioned that uh, a six-item scale that we developed from this study in Inverness, because um, remember we interviewed everybody, all 390 of them doing clinical interviews on them, and so from that we had sufficient data to empirically extrapolate what might be useful as a useful screen. This is called the B-bars, it came from the Bar Russell Barclay scale that we started with, and we took the most powerful out items that predicted ADHD, and interestingly enough, the six items, three related to when they're a child, uh, and three items related to the current, the past six months. So we've developed this. It's available on my website. You can just go in and download it for free. And it, it, was, uh, it had high specificity and sensitivity for predicting ADHD. Oh, that's what I've just said. That's <laughs> how we developed it. This is how we did it. And I've just gone through it and told you that it had high diagnostic accuracy. Okay, that was just a bit. Um, the DIVA for adults is a very good clinical interview. Most of you will know about the DIVA for adults. I then developed the ADHD child evaluation, which is a clinical interview for assessing ADHD in children, and also then went on to develop the ACE+. Plus. It differs to the DIVA uh, because the ACE+, Plus considers DSM and ICD-10, so you could choose either. Um, but it also includes an entire section that will prompt you to consider the presence of comorbid conditions. So it prompts you to consider differential diagnosis and comorbid conditions. It also contains a whole background section, whereas the DIVA has a lot of tick boxes. So, you know, the DIVA has its place, but horses for courses, some people prefer ACE+, Plus. I'm trying to get it known. It's free to, have a, it's, it's free to download on my website. So um, if you want it, just go onto the website in the resources section and take a look, download it. And if you like it or see it, please let other people know. I'm not a big marketing machine. You are my marketing now. Um, so, I, you know, because I make all these things free, I don't have the funding to sort of market it. So, uh, you know, I try to let as many people know about this as I can. Um, this is an older thing. What this... I. This is uh, the first set of slides that I sent through. I was supposed to show you the brain gains link because um, the ACE 
uh, and ACE Plus are available in electronic format. So I don't do you have on your slides the actual link for the Brain Gaze link? You might have them actually on the slide. Um, it might be shown. It's like that. Okay, this is the old one. Okay. Um, well, it's on my website. If you go onto the website, you'll see the link, and you can get an electronic version of ACE. So you can do it on a computer, and um, it's free uh, for a three-month trial because it's new. So you can get it to try it for three months, but then after that has to be paid for because obviously it's been. It, the brain gates have developed it. Barriers to treatment, what are these? So what we found in ISIS, in the study that we, we were doing that I presented to you, one of the problems was they're not unlocked from their cell. <laughs> Staying in the cell for a long time. Solution was to work with prison officers to try to, uh, we, we discussed that over there. Some don't want to get up. And again, working with offenders and nursing staff. So about that, about ways to, because we need to get them up and active and out. So some people had the, and I think that's a sense of hopelessness, you know, just want to stay under the covers and not face the world. Uh, strict timing of medication in prisons can be difficult with, uh, with when you're titrating uh, different doses. Um, and so some flexibility, we felt, trying to introduce flexibility, which can be hard to negotiate with the prison. Is, is helpful. Um, some people they don't they don't take medication in the morning, in which case we're asking for a midday dosing. And again, that's about flexibility in the prison as to whether they can accommodate that. Some people are finding that they take a long-acting medication. They take it in the morning, and then late afternoon or early evening, the symptoms re-emerge, and they're struggling then in the evening. Okay, when they're uh, you know engaged in recreational activities, and so. Um, you know, maybe a morning and again another slightly lower dosing, perhaps in the evening might be better. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not a psychiatrist, but uh, so I can't comment about doses. But I think this pattern is quite common with giving different doses at different times. Um, adverse effects uh, when when the for, for common adverse effects that these pattern. Uh, we need to explain that and give them support to the prisoner when they experience like side effects or other adverse effects. And a big one is overthinking. We need to give them support, again, an explanation for this. And overthinking, I think, is very interesting. Um, and I think it's because when somebody, a prisoner, take John, they, they go on medication and life starts to change and turns around. And then they start thinking and that seeing the opportunities that are available, seeing they start to achieve things that they've not done before. And then they look back and they start feeling angry and resentment about all the missed opportunities. The number of times they've sat in front of an educational healthcare professional who seems to know there's something wrong but has missed the ADHD. The fact that, you know, my brother went to university and I didn't. You know, there's there's this overthinking and and thinking, and in fact, I remember when I, I you know I worked in in Broadmoor for many years, for eleven years, and I remember a young man in Broadmoor in the PD unit who went on uh, was diagnosed with ADHD, went on the medication, and actually immediately uh, soon afterwards became they had to really watch him and became a suicide risk because he was going back and reflecting back over years and thinking about well, if this had been recognised, I might have had a better relationship with my mother and things might have been much better, and it was very sad. So this overthinking, when you're no longer being distracted, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, uh, and it, so it, it's, 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 it's a, is an issue. These are my books. The Orange Book, if you want, is the one that has all about a uh, psychological guide to practice for adolescents and adults. It's available from Amazon quite cheaply. Um, and it also talks about talks not just about treating ADHD, but about treating people with ADHD with coexisting comorbid conditions. These are the ones that I launched last year to work with children. The helping children with ADHD is for healthcare professionals, teachers, and parents. I actually encourage parents. There's not enough psychologists to go around, so I encourage parents to try this program, and they download the tools from the internet. And again, they can get that. So, consequences of the lack of identification of ADHD. Well, misdiagnosis, inappropriate treatment or inadequate or lack of a care pathway. It affects their capacity. There's no capacity to engage meaningfully 
in the judicial process, in police interview in court. The capacity to engage and benefit from rehabilitation activities, from offending behaviour programmes, education, occupation, as Fiona raised. Again, missed opportunities in situ. Impacts on behaviour and management problems, how they present in prison. Then, in turn, they'll have a higher number of adjudications. They're less likely to access early relief. We've seen it. They become revolving door offenders, in, out, in, out, in, out. Sometimes for quite small things, but remember that first graph, as it goes on, even the smaller things, it accumulates. And judges are thinking, well, you should have, you're not learning, so the sentences might increase. And then, clear that there's an association of cost burden to society in terms of the crime, but also in terms of cost for the prison system. If we don't want to confer health gain to individuals, then we need to argue about costs to the prison situation and how to relieve the burden on society and the family. If you want to hear, learn more about this, about, uh, uh, about ma assessing, managing and treating prisoners, uh, and pri people in the prison population that we focused on, um, with ADHD, we produced an expert consensus paper last year in 2018. It's published in BNC Psychiatry, um, and that's open access, so it's free. You just go on there, put my name in there. Uh, thing is, you'll get everything with young in it, yeah, young and everything. But uh, so uh, you know, so it's good to pick another name like Good Johnson, G U D J O N W -S, S O N, and my name. And or if you just put my name and consensus, it it will come up. And you'll see others as well that we've done. We've got one that we're doing at the moment. Uh, that's currently being reviewed uh, about ADHD and ASD, autism, when they're comorbid, 21% overlap. And I'm writing another one at the moment, almost finished it, about females with ADHD. And I've got a couple more planned for next year. So we do these consensus, they're all in open access, but the prison one is done. So I'm afraid I literally have to fly. <laughs> um, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sorry, I don't think I haven't got time for questions. But I hope you found it helpful. And it's been lovely being back in Dublin. Hopefully I can stay a little bit longer next time. Um, you'll find loads of resources on my website. They're all free. Please take a look and let people know about them if you like them. Thank you very much.